you know, first of all, we're very, very busy. Uh, we live our lives on the run, kind of squeezing God in where we can. Uh, secondly, we end up living off other people's spirituality because we don't have the time. You know, thirdly, most of us are overloaded, we're, we're exhausted, uh, we're scattered, fragmented, uncentered, distracted. Um, and fourthly, we, we end up multitasking because we, we're doing so many things at once, we're actually even unaware we're even doing it that way. We're always on the way to someplace, always on the way to something. And as a result, few people have time to develop their own direct experience of God. We have a lot of head knowledge about him, but a lot of it's not penetrated our hearts. And so we sing songs about his love and his goodness. But then when everything falls apart, we wonder, you know, where is God? What happened? Because it's not had time to get deeply into us. In fact, most people really, when we think of prayer, prayer is about abiding with God, being with God. Most of us don't really do very much of that. In fact, you know, even, even pastors don't even pray that much. And I'm one of them. And uh, what does that say for everyone else? It's really, you know, few people as we know it are, are intentional that my whole life is pursuing Jesus. And so what happens is we end up living off books and sermons and CDs and kind of spiritual crumbs that might come our way. And we even talk about slowing down a lot or creating margin in our lives. We attend seminars for it, but the truth is it's, it's, it's almost like being on a drug. We, we can't stop. Uh, and, and it's this combination we're talking about here in this EHS course, the combination of emotional health and a slow down contemplative spirituality that releases a revolution in, our, in the transformation of God in our lives. So we need emotional health, and we've been talking about that. But we also need some of the riches of the contemplative tradition that are found in scripture and history, things that will slow us down so we can be with Jesus out of which we can live our lives. So this session is introducing you to two ancient spiritual formation disciplines that go back thousands of years, the daily office and Sabbath. Both of these are groundbreaking, they're countercultural. They're, they're powerful disciplines that provide a means for us to reorient our entire lives toward our new center, and that's God. Now the first ancient practice is called the daily office. Now most of us were taught to have quiet time or, or devotions in the morning. We spend time with him in the morning, we read the Bible, maybe pray a bit. Uh, I used to do it, kind of get charged up for the day and hopefully remember God throughout the day. The problem, however, is that it, it just, it's not enough. By midday, I'd be so wrapped up in the demands of the day, answering email, texts, uh, phone calls, that I was rarely even thinking about God by midday, let, let alone have a conversation with him or listen to him. I, I underestimated, like many of us, how many distractions are coming our way all day long that cut us off from union with God, as well as just the power of evil in the world and, and my own tendency to go my own way with my self-will. So I've purposely changed the name from quiet time and devotions to the daily office because I wanna communicate something unique and powerful. Because the focus of a daily office is to be with God, not to get something from him. The focus is about communion or abiding, remaining in Jesus. Uh, and the daily office is not about meeting with God just once a day in the morning, but actually pausing to be with him two, three, maybe four times a day. The daily office comes from an ancient Greek word that means the work of God. It comes out of David in Psalm 27, uh, where David says, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon his beauty and seek him in his temple. And that is that my number one work, regardless of our vocations, is to be with God. Now we know that David practiced set times of prayer seven times a day from the book of Psalms. Uh, we know Daniel prayed three times a day. We see that in Daniel chapter six. Devout Jews during Jesus' time prayed two to three times a day as well. And, and, and scholars believe that Jesus naturally prayed uh, uh, with them. Uh, with the Jewish custom of praying morning, midday, and evening. But we know, of course, Jesus prayed other times as well. So, so I'm gonna invite you to pause, not just once a day to be with God, but actually two or three times. Why? So that when you're active, the other parts of the day, you might be more attentive to his voice and his presence. So this pausing to be with God can last anywhere from two minutes to 20 minutes to 45 minutes. It's up to you. But the actual stopping is what makes the practice of the presence of God to use Brother Lawrence's phrase, a real possibility. That's the goal. For me, it's been life-changing. You know, being with God in the morning uh, and before I go to bed is really quite easy. But it's the midday prayer that's really changed me to pull out, in a sense of all my activities, somewhere between 11 and 2 p.m. in the daytime to be with God has been really quite revolutionary. It's not so much what I do, whether it's read a psalm or pray the Lord's Prayer or be silent for a few minutes before the Lord, it's my heart gets readjusted, my, my will gets centered on Him. And I realize, why am I pushing so hard on these meetings and this agenda? It's not that important. Or what, what, maybe I'm anxious about one of my children. It's just the pause reminds me that, you know what? He's on the throne. Pete, relax. Just release your daughter to me.
Uh, again, there are endless possibilities and tools for what you can do with your time with God during these times. And God's built each of, each of us differently. So what works for one person may not work for another. Yet there are four elements, I believe, that, that need to be found probably in, in, in an office, regardless of what approach you ultimately choose. And so here's what they are. The first is stopping. I mean, that's the essence of a daily office. We stop our activity and we pause to be with the living God. Secondly, is we center. It, it comes out of the scripture that says, be still before the Lord and, and wait patiently for him, Psalm 37. You know, be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46. Basically, we move into God's presence and, and we rest there. Thirdly, there's an element of silence, and it's really critical. I, I like what Dallas Willard once wrote. He said, silence and solitude are the two most radical disciplines of the Christian life. And as Henry Nouwen said, that without solitude, it's almost impossible to live a spiritual life. For me, that silence is, is just indispensable. And fourthly, the scripture. Uh, you know, a good guide to follow when dealing with tools and techniques is this. You know, it, you know, if it helps, do it. If it doesn't help you, don't do it. And that includes a daily office. So to get started, I want to invite you, you know, use the daily office book that accompanies the EHS course. It's called, you know, Emotional Health Day by Day. And uh, let it help you kind of step out of this 24-7 culture that never stops and develop a rhythm in your days with God. But the second ancient treasure I want to introduce you to uh, here is Sabbath keeping. The daily office concerns itself with a daily rhythm each day. Sabbath keeping is about a weekly rhythm for our lives. Now the word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew and it means to cease or to stop working. It refers to doing basically nothing related to your work for a 24 hour period each week. The reason this is so radical in our culture is because we know nothing about setting aside a whole day, a whole 24 hours to rest and delight uh, in God. Like most, I always considered it an optional extra for most of my Christian life. It, it, it wasn't something essential to my discipleship. And while I would not put Sabbath keeping on a par with murder or adultery, it is an essential spiritual formation discipline. And we're not saved by Sabbath, we're saved by Christ. But as Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. It's a gift for you to receive. And, uh, and so if you even look at the Ten Commandments uh, with me, you know, you'll notice there's ten there. But the longest and most specific of the Ten Commandments is the fourth. You know, it reads, remember the Sabbath day, you know, by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, your maidservant or manservant, nor your animals, nor the ailing within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, there are two extremes to the way people approach Sabbath. On one extreme is legalism. This says if you don't keep Sabbath, God's angry. It's like you committed murder. He's mad at you. There's all kinds of rules and don't do's that end up around this kind of a view. That's one extreme. The other treats Sabbath as irrelevant and there's no need to even bother with it at all. That's kind of really what I was taught. But the balance, and I would argue the biblical position, is that Sabbath keeping is a core spiritual formation discipline. It's kind of like praying and reading scripture. We're saved by Jesus alone. We're not saved by reading the Bible or praying. In the same way, we aren't saved by keeping Sabbath. God doesn't love you more if you do certain things. But the fact is, if we're not praying, we're not reading scripture, we're probably not growing very much spiritually. The same applies with Sabbath. It's an indicator. It's one of the best indicators I know that we're too busy and that we're, not, and that we're probably doing too much. Practicing Sabbath is about setting a regular rhythm every seven days for a 24 hour block of time. Now traditional Jewish Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday and ends on sundown uh, Saturday. Others choose a day of the week like Saturday or Sunday all day. The Apostle Paul seemed to think one day would do as well as another. What's important is to select a time period and protect it. For Jerry and I, we normally Sabbath from 6 p.m. Friday night to 6 p.m. Saturday night. We'll start by lighting a candle, having a special meal, a prayer. But like the daily office, it's changed our marriage. It's changed our family. It's, it's changed our walk with God. It's helped us slow down for our rhythm in a world that doesn't have one and that just keeps moving faster and faster. So let me just share with you very briefly the four principles that have really served us well in distinguishing a day off from a biblical Sabbath. See, a secular Sabbath or a secular day off is just to replenish our energies and make us more effective the other six days. That's not a Sabbath. A Sabbath is, it says in the commandment there, is to the Lord our God. In other words, it has certain elements uh, to it. Now, each of us has different temperaments, different personalities, different life situations, different callings. So the way Sabbath is gonna get worked out 
for you is gonna be different than it is for me. It's gonna be a process you'll need to go into that's trial and error to figure out what works best for me. But here's the following four principles that can guide you. The first is one stop. You know, Sabbath is first and foremost a day of stopping. Now most of us, we can't stop until we're finished, whatever it is we think we need to do. We need to complete our projects, answer our emails, return all the phone messages, complete balancing the checkbook, finish cleaning the house. There's always one more thing to do before stopping. Sabbath invites us to build doing nothing into our schedules each week. Nothing measurable is accomplished. In fact, by the world standards, it's inefficient, it's unproductive, it's useless. As one theologian said, to, to fail to see the value of simply being with God and doing nothing is to miss the heart of Christianity. So we stop on Sabbaths because God's on the throne. Uh, he, he assures us the world will not fall apart if we cease our activities. God's at work taking care of the universe. He will manage quite well without you when, you, you know, when your life ends. Uh, he's doing quite well running it. Okay, that's first. Secondly, quality is not just stop, we rest. Once we stop, the Sabbath calls us, invites us to rest. God rested after his work, we're to do the same. Every seventh day, resting from our paid and unpaid work. We rest from things like hurry and physical exhaustion and catching up on errands and technology and machines. But again, what's a rest to one person may not be rest to another. Uh, when we stop and rest, we respect our humanity and the image of God in us, that we're not doing machines. We, we, we can't do violence to our souls. We too need a rhythm of work and rest. The third quality, and I would say perhaps the most important is the word delight. Uh, because a biblical Sabbath revolves around delighting in what we have been given. God, after finishing the work of creation on the first Sabbath, proclaims it's very good. And the word there in Hebrew is he beams with delight. On Sabbath, we are invited to enjoy and delight in God's creation and his gifts. That's why if the day turns out to be a lot of don't do this and don't do that, you've missed the whole point. We are to slow down our lives and pay attention to the innumerable gifts of life that God's provided for us to enjoy. We take time to see the beauty of a tree, a leaf, a flower, taste our food, see the people around us, enjoy music and art. It's endless. But then a fourth quality is, is we contemplate. That is, we, we see the invisible God in the visible creation. Because we're stopping our work, we now actually have time to intentionally focus on seeing and receiving God through all of life. We, we ponder his love as it comes through things like food and nature and, and music. We, we look to see his gifts. It's true we wanna do that on all seven days, but in particular, we wanna train ourselves and God gives us a Sabbath to actually receive the invisible God in the visible world around us. So, so we're actually pondering the love of God really remains the central focus of our Sabbaths. For this reason, Saturday nights to Sunday nights is great for most folks attending churches or all day Sundays. It's an ideal time for Sabbath keeping whenever possible because in a sense, worship is built into that. So on every Sabbath, we experience a sampling of something greater that awaits us. Our short earthly lives are put in perspective as we look forward to the day when we will see him face to face, when God's kingdom will come in all of its fullness. In a sense, we're headed for an eternal Sabbath feast and every week we are to taste eternity. As one rabbi said, if we don't enjoy the taste of eternity on Sabbaths, what makes you think you're gonna enjoy it when you see him face to face? There will be a day we will stop, rest, delight, and contemplate him fully when we see him face to face. So we, along with our staff at New Life Fellowship, we often say, how did we ever live without Sabbath? And the answer is, you know, we did violence to our souls. So Sabbath keeping and the daily office are two truly countercultural spiritual formation disciplines that really have the capacity to slow you down for a rhythm in your life. Most importantly, they, they help us stay tuned to God's presence for our days and for our weeks. So as you go into this session in your workbook, remember this is a radical shift for our lives in the 21st century. It will take a while for you to figure out how to do these things in your context in light of your unique personality. But let this session guide you in taking your first small steps towards a less hurried life that's anchored and centered in the love.